This chapter we're going to be covering is preventing disease transmission. It's chapter nine in your book. So if we look here, you've got some um, objectives, so define, state, demonstrate, and when we're in lab, you're actually going to be demonstrating um, some of these things, which is a lot of fun. So here's some more objectives and your key terms. So more key terms. Looking here with our infectious diseases, um, make sure you read your chapter because I'm just giving you a quick overview of everything and there's a lot more detail within the chapter, so be sure to read that. So there's a lot of emerging diseases within healthcare that um, are that go in ways. So bird flu, Ebola, there's a lot of different things. So um, if you acquire one of the, uh, a disease within the hospital, we call it um, healthcare associated infections um, or nosocomial uh, diseases. We have bloodborne pathogens that we need to be concerned with, and tuberculosis is uh, still an issue. Um, we are still dealing with tuberculosis in the hospital, and we are required to get screened every year for it. So emerging diseases are new diseases appearing in the population, existing diseases that are rapidly increasing or incidence of or a geographic area. So they can be uh, geographically specific. Um, resurgence of a reoccurring old disease caused by an old or mutated pathogen that is morphing a little bit. Um, so there's MRSAs that's been around forever. So now there's antibiotic resistant um, MRSAs and there's just all kinds of things um, as they, they change and morph to adapt. Um, infection control uh, department of the hospital is responsible for keeping everything up to date and they usually use the CDC recommendations and the World Health Organization, which is WHO. So World Health Organization is WHO um, and they use their data um, for um, the whole world and look at wh what the emerging diseases are. So emerging diseases continued. So we have disease emergences. Um, precipitated by many factors, so an increase in human exposure to vectors in nature, population growth and migration in crowded cities, rapid international travel and transportation of goods, contact with new strains and dangerous pathogens, and pathogen mutation caused by overuse of antimicrobial agents, breakdown in public health measures, climate change has something to do with it, and bioterrorism. So those are all factors that affect diseases and their process and how we're, we're exposed. Okay, hospital, healthcare associated infections. So those that occur more than 48 hours after the patient is admitted to the hospital. Um, it's a newer term, it's HAI, healthcare associated infections, which were nosocomial infections. So they're kind of transitioning out of nosocomial into the HAI, which is interesting. Um, they are of the greatest concern, um, are MRSA and BRE. Um, a lot of these strands are um, resistant to any kind of antibiotic that we can give, so um, they can become deadly to patients. Approximately um, 700,000 patients admitted to hospitals each year, 75,000 die from um, HAIs. Eesh. So the 10th leading cause of death, and it costs us about 28 to 34 billion in healthcare costs. So it's preventable. So the biggest thing is contaminating the hands of the healthcare workers. So it's really important that you wash your hands constantly, wear gloves, take your gloves off. Uh, contaminated instruments is another way, and urinary catheters, ventilators, central lines, and surgical sites can be a site where um, you become or the patient becomes infected. 75,000 people die from this every year. That's absolutely insane. All right, so uh, another very common HAI is Clostridium difficile. Uh, colitis, it's a gastrointestinal um, infection that causes diarrhea and it's difficult to control but cannot be eliminated by routine abscesses uh, methods and the patient on antibiotics is the most susceptible. 
bloodborne pathogens, we have HIV and AIDS. So HIV is a bloodborne virus that causes AIDS. It's destruction of the immune system. It's transmitted through sexual contact, contaminated blood or needles. So sharing of needles, which is not good. Um, blood or fluids containing blood, placenta communication from the mother to fetus. And um, oh, <laughs> that's mother's milk, by the way. I don't know why it says mother's mild. I like that though, mother's milk. There's hepatitis, there's A through E. A and E are food and water contaminated with feces. B, C, and D are bloodborne. So needle stick injuries are the most common cause of transmission uh, from patient to healthcare workers. So watch the needles, make sure you know where they're at and you dispose of them properly. That's why we have so many safeties on our needles now. Um, they try to make it almost impossible for you to get stuck, but we're still getting stuck. All right, tuberculosis. All of us know what tuberculosis is. So um, it's an airborne lung disease. Uh, most patients are homeless, but I don't agree with that anymore. Uh, recent are immigrants. So most of the time it's immigrants coming over or people that are, um, their immune system is compromised. We always do a pre-employment screening and we also, so if you're gonna start at some facilities, if you're gonna do the skin test, we require a two-step and then every year after that, just a single or the quantiferon, which I find to be better. So um, you don't even know most of the times that you've been exposed. So uh, it's really important that we get screened. So there's 9,500 new cases in US every year and 9 million globally. Is that crazy? And that was back in 2013. So preventing disease transmission. So if we look at historically, we had standard precautions. So it's a system to protect healthcare providers from all patients and OSHA bloodborne pathogen standards develops an exposure control plan for the work site describing employee protection measures. There's medical asepsis. So we look at clean, cleanliness measures, disinfection, sterilization, hand hygiene. Hand hygiene has been the biggest. So handling and disposing of contaminated items and waste and isolation techniques. So we, we look at all of this and we figure out how we're going to be able to treat that patient. So, um, so if we look at uh, quarantines, um, we used to do that to contain the infectious disease. So um, we tell patients, don't leave your house um, and no one is allowed to enter until you're healthy. So when hospitals were first instituted, infectious patients were isolated to a single ward. So everyone with TB would be in the West Wing, whatever. So isolation techniques evolved from this practice. So isolation no longer commonly used, but it's still legal practice of the United of the US Public Health Service for disease such as uh, cholera, uh, cholera and dysphoria, smallpox, TB, plague, yellow fever, SARS, um, will still quarantine those, those people. And the government can quarantine you. So if they think you have one of these, they can quarantine you, it is legal. So protective measures of the past, so universal precautions, they focus on barriers against bloodborne pathogens. And we look at body substance precautions, so expanded protection um, to all moist body secretions. Standard precautions, so current, current infection control system, so we just call it standard precautions, is designed to reduce the risk of transmission of infections from unrecognized sources of bloodborne diseases and from other pathogens in healthcare um, institutions include transmission-based precautions for air, droplet, and contact. So OSHA's bloodborne pathogen standards in 1991, it requires employers to develop an exposure control plan for the work site that describes employee protection measures, measures, includes engineering and workplace practice controls to ensure the use of personal protective clothing and equipment, provides signals and labels to identify biohazard materials, provide annual bloodborne pathogen training, hepatitis B vaccines, and medical care in the event of exposure. So that is required by OSHA now. So medical asepsis involves reducing the probability of infectious organisms be transmitted to a susceptible individual. 
So microbial uh, dilution. So the process of reducing the number of organisms. So we do that through hand washing um, and being clean. Don't leave, so wipe down everything when you're done. Um, we disinfect when we can and there's sterilization, which is complete surgical abscesses. So there's no pathogens found. Hand hygiene, you need to wash your hands for 30 to 60 seconds with soap and water. Now make sure you get under your nails and you scrub your cuticles in each crease of your joint because a lot of bacteria will hide within those. There's alcohol-based rubs, so those are really good. I'm constantly in the hospital putting that on. It's more effective at killing um, some hospital-acquired infections, uh, such as C. diff. Um, most convenient than accessing sinks all the time, and you can look at 9.1 in your box for the CDC guidelines for use. Cleaning techniques. So cleaning reduces the incident of airborne infections and the transfer of pathogens by fomites. Always clean the least contaminated area towards more contaminated and from the top down. Avoid um, raising dust. So make sure when you're cleaning, you're not stirring up a bunch of dust, especially if there's organisms within the dust. Do not contaminate yourself or clean areas. After each use, clean all equipment that comes in contact with patients. Use a cloth moistened with disinfectant. And then the CDC recommends um, certain uh, solutions to be used, and the hospitals typically have those everywhere. Handling and disposing of contaminated items and waste. So replace linens after each patient. Uh, to dispose of contaminated uh, linens, you're going to fold the edges into the middle without shaking or flapping. Place closely balled linens in design designated hamper. Sharps container is proper disposal for needles and blood contained items such as gauze and bandages have a biohazard disposal. So there is the biohazard, which is red. So if we look here, um, we have our Sharps container and it's locked so you can't get in it. Um, don't reach inside this if it's not locked. If you drop something in there like your wedding ring or something like that, don't be reaching in there to get it out. Um, that's a, absolutely what we do not want you to do. Then you can see this red biohazard and usually the red bags and you can put anything that's drippy or has blood, um, any kind of bodily product that is drippy oozy goes in the biohazard. As part of the standard precautions, CDC currently recommends isolating um, patient based on transmission precautions. So if a patient has you know, SARS or Ebola, um, we want to isolate that. So here's the different signs. So there's contact, which is typically green. Now, not all facilities have these colored signs, although they are pretty standard. Um, you can see contact precautions, and it tells you you need gloves, gown, mask, um, eyewear, and I'm not sure what that is. So um, here you can see we have airborne. Air, so in contact, you're just going to make sure that, oh, you wash your hands. That's what it is. I couldn't tell it looked like a toilet. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So contact, you know, be smart about it. Whatever your body is going to come into contact with the patient, you want to have covered. Airborne, you need to make sure that you have a mask on, that you're protecting yourself. And droplet mask also, and cover your eyes. All right, so radiography of isolation. And so requires two technologists, one, um, has all the patient contacts. So if you're an MRI, it is a problem because you're probably going to be solo. So you need to put on all the gear, get the patient onto the table. And if you can bring the table out of the room, that's the best way to go. Put them on, have someone help you, and then just bring them straight into the room and try not to touch them. So if you're in x-ray, it requires two techs. One has all the patient contact. The other one has no patient contact and handles um, only handles the equipment. Reduces the contamination of the equipment, which is difficult to disinfect. So same with MRI. You don't want to have any extra anything because you have to clean after whatever the patient's been in contact with. When the patient is in the department, use sheets to cover the table, wheelchair, whatever. So if you're an MRI, you're going to have sheets. And I wrap my patients up in the sheets, kind of like a burrito roll, so that they're not contaminating directly um, my bore. So... 
um, and wear the protective equipment. So don't be lazy. Make sure you put that on. All right, precautions for compromised patients. So it includes neonates, organ transplant, burn victims, and those receiving high-dose chemotherapy. So it's, it's an older uh, terminology, protective isolation or reverse isolation. So I see it as protective or reverse. So when you talk about, um, we look here, we're talking about isolation um, and we are trying to protect ourselves. With reverse isolation, we're trying to protect the patient. So we may require modified surgical aseptic technique. Two radiographers are recommended. Um, you are still going to protect that patient in the same manner that you would on a patient that's infected. So the idea is this patient doesn't have an immune system that is going to be able to fight anything you expose them to. So you need to make sure you protect that patient. So um, here is your preparation for the exam in isolation. You, you can use um, hand hygiene, so you can use the alcohol or you can wash your hands. Make sure that the hair is covered. Put on a cap or, or a hood. Put on a mask and certain that the nose is completely covered and that it fits snug. So there's a little metal tab in there that you're going to press down to make sure it nothing uh, can get in there. All right, you're going to put on your gown, you're going to fasten your gown, make sure it's uniform and completely covered, and you're going to put on protective gloves. So you should look like this when this final picture when you're done. All right, so if you're in radiography, you're going to have the person who is contaminated handle the bag. The person who is clean is going to um, handle the equipment. So this person who is contaminated should not have any um, contact with the equipment where the person who is clean should be handling all the equipment and we use these rad bags um, to keep everything clean and if you're an MRI if there's a way that you can keep your equipment clean um, you're going to want to do that all right so that is your lecture on chapter 9